How's it going, YouTube? Unfortunately, it is not a happy Tuesday. Um, this morning at 1.30 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, a uh, cargo ship, having lost power, collided with one of the main support beams or main, main support columns for uh, the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. And the bridge, unfortunately, collapsed, being unable to withstand the... Uh, uh, the tonnage of that container ship, which one estimate I heard put it at about 115,000 tons uh, gross weight. I'm not sure if that's accurate. It could have been far less. It could even have been much more. I don't know, but I'm just going off of a basic number that uh, I came across in passing. Given the size of this ship, I think it's at least an 80,000 ton ship minimum. Um, but uh, certainly 115 or more is not beyond the realm of possibility. And uh, uh, that much mass, uh, even moving at low speed, does not stop quickly. And as a result, uh, the bridge was unable to withstand the collision. Uh, some of the initial uh, knee-jerk... Uh, quarterbacking on this in hindsight is that uh, bridges in the U.S. that don't currently have uh, any form of anti-collision uh, system in place, meaning actual barricades or barriers or something that will cause a ship that has lost control, lost power, or lost steerage in some capacity, um, it will, you know, either bring that, arrest that mass and bring it to a stop or divert it away from um, the structure of the bridge itself. Whatever bridges do not currently have that in place, I'm sure will be the states and the port authorities that deal with those bridges will be looking at rectifying that situation as quickly as they possibly can. Um, so be looking out for uh, state legislatures and or federal action uh, to be happening in that regard here pretty soon. Uh, of course, there are still a bunch of folks who are missing uh, when the bridge collapsed, and uh, I'm hopeful that there will be some positive stories coming out of the situation in terms of people recovered alive uh, from their cars, and the construction workers recovered uh, from the, uh, the bridge itself. Uh, there were several construction workers on site who were working on pothole remediation and pothole repair. Um, when the cargo ship struck and according to some information I saw in some different news stories about this uh, catastrophe um, several of those construction workers uh, were trying to stop traffic uh, before the ship hit and I want to commend those construction workers uh, for uh, their valor and their heroism in attempting to uh, prevent additional uh, you know, injury or loss of life uh, as the ship was getting closer and closer to the bridge. Um, that's those folks will go down as heroes. They will be remembered as such, and rightly so. Uh, and I'm hoping that a lot of those folks who have not yet been found will be found alive. Um, same with those folks who went down with their cars. I hope by some miracle that some of those folks have gotten out of their were able to get out of their cars before uh, they sank all the way to the bottom. Um, and that they were not trapped in twisted wreckage. Uh, but unfortunately, based on my memories of the Minnesota bridge collapse in the uh, Twin Cities area, I think it was um, back in 2007. Um, I think it was 2007. Uh, the prognosis is not good for those folks uh, who went into the water this morning. Uh, which is extremely unfortunate and as hopeful as I am that there will be some you know good stories coming out of this uh, history does not suggest that there will be uh, but we have to remain hopeful and I certainly extend my best wishes and uh, thoughts towards the families of those who are missing loved ones and I really do hope for uh, positive news for you folks as soon as possible uh, Pivoting away from, you know, the initial uh, aftermath of that, obviously the Port of Baltimore is shut until they can go through a process of investigation into the ship and uh, the bridge structure itself. Um, there will be a forensic process that has to happen. Um, and 
my personal estimate, again, I, I, I'm a truck driver, not an engineer. I'm not a forensic expert in any capacity, but just based on historical trends for these situations, uh, my expectation is that it will be at least two weeks before they are given the go ahead to begin clearing uh, wreckage from the uh, the channel so they can begin moving shipping around uh, the span. Uh, but it's likely it's going to be at least uh, a month before they have any meaningful uh, ability to move traffic into or even really out of uh, the Port of Baltimore here. Before, um, you know, the ships that are stuck in the Port of Baltimore, it's going to be at least a month before they can really move, if I had to guess. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of folks doing their very best to see what they can do to expedite that. But uh, right now, the first and foremost... Um, First and foremost, effort is going to be in search and rescue and then recovery of those folks who unfortunately lost their lives in this situation. Um, and the uh, the human cost will first need to be assessed and all possibilities of hope will need to be expended before uh, the transition can happen into clearing the wrecked span of the bridge and opening at least a portion of that channel uh, to traffic leaving the port um, bef and then potentially, uh, hopefully, uh, getting a portion of that area clear where they can also allow traffic into the port uh, because according to some other information uh, and it's, uh, going off of a uh, statement made by uh, the Maryland governor uh, late last year, the Port of Baltimore supports 15,000 jobs directly and over 140,000 jobs indirectly and all of those jobs are currently uh, being negatively impacted, not to mention God only knows how many individual businesses ranging from very small to very large that are being negatively affected by this. Um, but I, just to you know, prognosticate and uh, perhaps uh, speculate on actions that are going to be happening in order to uh, continue uh, the economic flow in and around the port of Baltimore. Number one, um, the truck companies, whether they're individual owner operators or fleets that do anything with intermodal work in and around the port of Baltimore, they will be, they, they've, they've already been working hard all morning, all day um, to develop contingency, contingency plans for their customers and the freight that they're responsible for to ensure that those goods are moved to ports that, uh, can uh, send them on their way to their next destination, whether that's, you know, shipping up the coast somehow, some way, or um, transatlantic. Uh, there will also be significant demands placed on uh, the railroads, specifically uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern, to uh, begin moving train loads of container cars uh, away from Port of Baltimore to other viable ports, such as perhaps uh, you know, Norfolk and Newport News, um, you know, down the coast towards the Carolinas, um, you know, and up the coast towards New York City. Uh, there will be significant uh, rerouting of container traffic in that regard. There will also be a significant rerouting of, you know, indirect truckload traffic. That would have been loaded, uh, you know, dry vans, uh, reefers even. Um, those will all be rerouted as well. The trucking companies will be doing, we will be doing our best. I'm not speaking for me as an individual trucker. I'm speaking for hopefully the industry as a whole. The trucking industry will do whatever it possibly can to um, be of use in this situation in order to keep the flow of goods going because while recovery efforts are underway there still is a dramatic need to ensure that goods are flowing into and out of american ports in order to sustain uh, global trade and global economies as we uh, get further and further away from the pandemic era uh, so the trucking companies will do what we can to step up. Um, if I understood intermodal uh, traffic and intermodal work to a greater degree, I would be giving my own serious thought to trying to get out there with my one whole truck to see if I could be in any capacity of use. But because I know so little of intermodal work, uh, I expect that I would only get in the way. And unless there's a, a great call for individual owner operators to 
or small trucking companies or just trucking companies in general who can operate in port spaces such as with drivers who have uh, transportation worker identification cards, which I have, also known as the TWIC. I have a valid TWIC card. Um, unless there's a real call for such drivers to come to the Baltimore region in order to uh, move goods out of the port in order to free up space so they can unload ships that are stuck in order to get those goods onto other uh, modes of transportation such as rail rail um, rail based intermodal movements up and down the coast to other ports or even on trucks to get to other ports uh, or even possibly uh, transloading those containers uh, from you know shipping containers into uh, air freight if the uh, the, the volume is uh, light enough and low enough that it can be accommodated by an airliner either in, in a, an airborne freighter or um, you know, belly freight in a commercial uh, airline like with United or British Airways or whoever. Um, you know, that stuff will probably happen to the degree that is most feasible. But uh, what's really going to be uh, the major problems that the Port of Baltimore and that region will face is the movement of coal. Um, I, I, I guess there's a, a lot of coal that goes out of that port. Um, and on to international destinations. I don't know who we're selling the coal to. I'm assuming we're selling it to uh, Europe and especially England. I know England uh, has had some serious issues uh, being able to uh, accept the uh, global climate uh, consequences of you know, coal-fired power plants. So they've been buying a lot of energy from the U.S. in order to transfer their carbon output numbers towards us. Um, which, okay, great, I really don't care. I think all that's kind of a made-up bit of fluff anyway. That's not really going to be helpful to us in the long term, but that's me and I'm not super knowledgeable, so I'll just leave that there for the moment. Um, there's also uh, the uh, the Port of Baltimore apparently was one of the largest ports in the U.S., if not the largest port in the U.S., in terms of vehicle imports and I think possibly also exports. Handled almost a million cars and trucks uh, last year alone, apparently, uh, I could be wrong on my numbers, but a lot of you know new vehicle imports and I believe also exports uh, went through Port of Baltimore. So that will, for the interim, that's going to have to go somewhere else, or those ships are going to have to wait offshore until a plan of action can be announced and uh, uh, funded to expeditiously clear the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge from uh, the port of Baltimore entrance. Uh, there's also the um, the question of truck traffic that would go through uh, Baltimore that would use the Francis Scott Key Bridge um, because there are some tunnels in that area, or at least a tunnel, and that tunnel, as most tunnels do, has a hazardous materials restriction, so hazmat carriers were forced to use the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Now those carriers either will have to divert onto approved uh, throughways uh, in and around Baltimore itself or reroute to avoid Baltimore, the, the whole region just entirely skip way out um, out to you know some road, highway or interstate that's far away from Baltimore or um, you know divert way way further west onto uh, you know, 81 possibly, and just, you know, skip the whole eastern portion of Maryland entirely until this uh, port situation gets resolved. Um, I don't do hazmat anymore. I'm not likely to do hazmat anytime soon, so I'm glad I won't have to worry about that. But as a matter of course, uh, because I'm just one man in one truck, unless there is a need or a call out for drivers like me or operators like me to go to Baltimore to in some capacity assist where it makes good sense for someone like me to you know volunteer and get out there. Um, I'm going to be trying to avoid adding to the problem in Baltimore by staying away from that region and just operating anywhere you know west and south of there. Um, just because I don't believe that me going to Baltimore would be of any use to uh, recovery efforts or to uh, uh, redirect efforts uh, for the flow of goods. 
uh, the trucking companies and the log other logistics companies that are going to be operating in and around Baltimore for the foreseeable future. I I have pretty good faith in those companies because it's going to be you know the usual suspects. You know, going to be J.B. Hunt, Werner, Schneider, uh, Swift, Knight, uh, Prime Inc., um, and of course CSX Norfolk Southern. Um, the, the big railroads and even some of the smaller spur lines will probably be working on this problem as well. Um, it's going to take uh, probably two years at least before a replacement bridge can be constructed. Uh, but I'm sure the first thing they're going to be doing is assessing what kind of anti-collision um, systems they could put into place around the piers of any future bridge to ensure that should a situation like this happen again, uh, there is a significant reduction in risk to the infrastructure of the port should a collision of this nature with a bridge span or a bridge um, structure happen in the future. As far as the ship itself, um, it's I believe it's the name is the MV Dolly. Um, and they say it was an all Indian crew. Um, some folks say it was a Ukrainian captain. So there's trying to throw all kinds of conspiracy crap around there. But uh, I want to address an element of racism on this subject right away. Uh, while it's way too early for us to speculate and tell what may have caused the uh, power outage in the ship itself, anyone who would seek to assign blame to the crew because of their race or their creed or where they come from, uh, I would say that you are making an extremely serious uh, leap as well as doing something incredibly uh, disingenuous to that crew because the ocean is an absolutely unforgiving uh, and undefeated uh, entity on our planet and you do not survive on the ocean unless you very quickly learn to be safe with your trade we hear stories year in and year out of fishermen and you know merchant mariners who lose their lives because of just one moment where they weren't safe or something happened that was beyond their control and bam they were gone um, the ocean is very unforgiving it doesn't matter if you're in a dinghy or you know, a 200,000 ton tanker. The ocean is unforgiving. You have to learn your trade quickly in order to survive on the ocean. So I am having a very difficult time assigning blame to the crew at this point. Uh, when you know NTSB and other uh, the Port of Baltimore authorities have you know gone through their investigative process and released the reports on what caused the power failure. Um, then blame can be appropriately assigned. Uh, as far as who was in charge of the ship during the accident, um, my understanding of the uh, the way U.S. ports work is that no matter who is in command of the ship, uh, when a large vessel uh, is coming into a port, especially a controlled port like the Port of Baltimore, um, the captain of the ship is not the one who is nominally in charge of the ship's movement. A pilot is brought out to the ship who is a trained expert on how to maneuver a ship through the channels and through the specific movement lanes into and out of the port. So the captain you know, receives the pilot. The captain might remain in nominal command, but the pilot is the one who will con the ship into and out of the port and then at a certain point the pilot then leaves the ship and then the captain is now fully in command of the ship uh, for the remainder of its voyage to its next port that's how u.s ports work so to assign blame to the captain at this point is also extremely premature um so it to assign blame to the captain and the crew at this point is again is, is premature i lost my train of thought there i wanted to say something else but it just didn't come to mind i didn't, I didn't want to try to belabor it uh, now, as to what might have caused the failure on the ship, there is a plethora of possibilities as to what may have caused the ship to lose power. It could have been an interrupt in the generators. It could have been a short in a junction box. It could have been uh, a problem that no one really diagnosed or addressed during the ship's last yard visit. It could have been damage the ship received in a storm somehow, some way. It could have been 
uh, you know, bilge water may have gotten in somewhere from an undetected leak that may have caused a short or a component failure in some capacity, or it could straight up just be a component chose the absolute worst time to fail and it really was no one's fault. Just absolutely unforeseen, you know, unforecastable component failure. That does remain a possibility in this situation. Uh, at least until we know for sure after the NTSB and the Port of Baltimore have concluded their investigations into the ship itself. Um, yes, I'm aware the ship has a bit of a checkered history. It has uh, been in collisions in the past, apparently. Uh, but those collisions were far enough in the past that any damage from those collisions should have been repaired. And the keyword there is should have. Uh, but... With a lot of these things, the, sometimes damage can stack up in a way you just don't uh, know or understand. And considering that these container ships, I mean, this ship only had a crew of 22 people on board, and it's mostly a big giant tub filled with containers all the way through. Um, but even so, that's how most of the world's freight is moved on these massive container ships. Uh, so you've got hundreds of thousands of tons, you know, let me rephrase that. You've got perhaps billions of tons of goods on thousands of container ships in motion globally, um, just constantly moving freight. So they don't. These ships are set up in such a way they don't need you know massive crews. They don't need you know warship level crews where you've got five hundred, a thousand, two thousand people. And especially in the case of our U.S. aircraft, U.S. Navy aircraft carriers, you've got crews of over 5,000 to keep that ship operational through three watches, 24-7, 365. Um, these ships just don't need that level of crew, um, and they're also not designed to support that level of crew either because the interiors of the rear of these ships are occupied by these absolutely monstrous, multi-story high power plants to move these massive ships through the water um if you watch any youtube videos about you know you know marine ships being having their engines started up or doing test runs or whatever you see the size of these engines i mean they're absolutely colossal and they're producing hundreds of thousands of shaft horsepower uh to drive you know these massive ships through the water um and it's it's uh, the engineering behind them is absolutely staggering i mean these are incredible incredible ships and that is what makes this whole situation all the more unfortunate because if I had to guess, and again, I'm guessing, it's going to end up being traced to, you know, one or maybe two small problems that might have been diagnosable during the ship's last yard period when it would have been unloaded, where they could have gotten to all the important components or, you know, and then, you know, fixed everything and made sure it was good to go and fully seaworthy or one of those situations where, like I was talking about earlier, a completely unforeseen problem happened to arise at the very last, the very worst possible moment. And as a result, we are now mourning the loss of, you know, a lot of folks who did not deserve to be lost this morning, uh, as well as, you know, celebrating uh, newly elected heroes uh, into, the, you know, the realms of valor. And the article of those construction workers who put their lives on the line to stop traffic uh, before the collision actually happened. So, um, again, all in all, it's a very unfortunate situation. And uh, my thoughts are with the families of those who are missing, especially those who have already been maybe recovered um, dead. And, uh, you know, my thoughts are also with the families of those construction workers who uh, put their lives on the line to stop traffic. Those guys went above and beyond and uh, their valor will definitely not be forgotten by anyone who works in their industry. Um, so with that being said, hopefully um, there is some resolution to the situation soon. Uh, hopefully the investigation um, is able to assign blame where it belongs and not to anyone who doesn't deserve it. And hopefully the uh, folks in and around Baltimore who relied on the port for their livelihood uh, get their jobs, their lives, and their businesses back on track as soon as possible. Uh, the logistics industry will do what it can to support those folks in terms of getting freight moving so that their goods can either be delivered to them or go from them to their customers as expeditiously as is possible um, in the current climate. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. and. Um, 
I will see you down the road. Take care. Be safe.